Thank you for inviting me to speak today about the work John was doing in Kenya. He had started to put a presentation together, as William has mentioned. Well, at least he had put the title, Poverty Reduction Through Forestry in Kenya, so I'll stick to that. I won't be able to talk as in-depth as John would have been able to, but I have put together more of a picture show, so literally some snapshot facts which I hope you will find interesting. I'd like to thank all those who supported the appeal recently for the Mogra Children's Home, particularly thanks to William and Nick and Stephen Matthews. They've helped push the cause along for me. Your generosity has resulted in some cameras and some laptops and a few other items that are all ready to be waiting to be shipped off to the um, orphanage in Nairobi. And I'll be showing images of that later so you can see the children's home and school environment. John enjoyed his years belonging to the Wellington Rotary Club and the friends he made here. It was only due to his heavy overseas commitments and agenda that he thought it best to resign a year or two ago. And I know that the thought was that he would rejoin again someday once things had quietened down on the travel front for him. So I thank you too for all the um, generosity that some of you have shown and the thoughts since John passed. Thank you for that. So John left for Kenya pretty much a year ago today. It was at the, He arrived there at the same time as the dreadful mass um, shooting in the Nairobi Mall, the Westfield Mall in Nairobi. Um, I joined him mid-November and we came back mid-January this year. So I'm sure, sure you all know where Kenya is. <laughs> so this is, this is just a quick look at what makes up Kenya and its economy. As you can see, unemployment is at 40%, so very high. Um, however, a good positive, I always like to know what a woman's lot is in a, in a country. So a good positive thing is that there is equal opportunity employment for women there, and they are paid the same rates as men. So why did John go to Kenya, and what was the work? The actual contract was with the Finnish government who are supplying aid to the Kenyan government, and in this case the Forest Service, the Kenyan Forest Service. A program called Mitikmingi Maishabora was set up in 2009, and its objective is to cause a reduction in poverty through ensuring the forest sector contributes effectively and sustainably to improving the lives of the poor and restoring the environment. John was part of a work study project within the Miti Mingi Maishabora program and silviculture is about the pruning and planting and thinning of trees. And this shows the specific tasks that were required and John was also asked to recommend remedial actions um, where there were variances to the international best practices. This graphic shows the main tree species that are grown there. There's cypress, pine, um, patchula pine, eucalypt, which is actually an exotic for Kenya. Um, the other area in purple, that's mainly indigenous, and there's over um, 800 or more species of indigenous trees, acacia, fever tree, and many others, so I won't list all those. Uh, there was a 12-year logging ban on all forests, which was only lifted a few years ago. And John noticed immediately the flow on effects of such a ban. The ban has brought about a massive backlog of delayed pruning and thinning of trees. And this has caused many plantations to become, as John described there, a state of neglect. But the big positive um, is that Kenya is one of the um, or has one of the highest tree growth rates in the world alongside some of the South American countries. And because of these great growing conditions, um, Kenya could easily become the largest wood producer in the world. So that was really positive. So before independence 50 years ago, um, the British set up the Kenyan Forest Service and it was definitely deja vu New Zealand. 
the compounds and the station offices there that we visited us visited reminded us both so much of New Zealand forest stations in the 70s and the early 80s. So it was very nostalgic. However, um, the difference being in, is that the Kenyan Forest Service is run paramilitary style. So everyone has their rank and their uniforms and good old fashioned respect for everybody. We were often greeted with a um, salute, hello sir and madam. There are frustrations, of course, with this style of, um, with, with being um, sort of paramilitary based. Um, decisions are not made quickly. <laughs> and I heard on a number of occasions station managers saying to John, John, we will just hurry up and wait. <laughs> um, oops, wrong one. Go back. <coughs> Sorry. So, this forest ranger here, he is actually armed, uh, but he's armed more uh, to because there are tree poachers, not necessarily wild animals. Um, but I do hear that they're only issued with one or two bullets at a time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So John's first task when he arrived was to visit all the forest stations that he would be assessing and to learn about the community forest associations and the palace scheme. The community forest associations or CFAs are officially sanctioned groups of farmers and locals who are allowed to take growing opportunities on the forestry land. In return they provide some labour back to the forest service and this brings a benefit of low plantation establishment costs uh, to the forest and the CFAs benefit by being able to grow more profitable crops. Other locals can also buy uh, grazing rights and firewood permits in the forest very cheaply and that all comes under the palace scheme. So it was also essential for John to meet the forest station managers and the foresters. He, he needed to see the on the ground reality and get an idea of tree size and the um, stocking of trees in all the compartments and learn um, any operational hindrances and all the technical side of things. The uh, top, top left pick, that's uh, Dundori Forest Station which is in the Kenyan Highlands. And despite a lack of um, absolute basic resource and utilities, they didn't even have the power here at this particular station. Um, Don, Dundori had an extremely well organised and effective CFA programme. In fact, I think it was the best one I saw out of the um, four or five stations I went to. Um, it could be seen in the quality of the seedlings they had growing and in, in the nursery and just how tidily everything was kept. Uh, I noticed uh, all the forest stations we went to all had very manual record keeping situations. I just don't know how they found their way through this. Um, and that's just one office full of them. So these images here uh, move us along to early January now and near the end of the contract time. Uh, the existing pruning practice was antiquated and fell well short of international best practice standards. Um, the CFA workers would just climb into the trees and use a punga, which is like a machete. And uh, while it got rid of the, the branches, it also caused horrific uh, scars on the tree. The absence absence of sort of acceptable ladders meant that workers would climb into the tree so then it sort of caused fatigue and brought about safety hazards and there was no sort of quality standards to follow in the tasks. Um, the CFA workforce really is um, by and large unskilled and John recommended more investment in on-the-job training plus he put forward a strong argument 
for introducing modern pruning tools um, and planned pruning methods and regimes for setting the quality standards. These images uh, show uh, the modern pruning equipment that John ordered from a New Zealand company in Levin and that arrived in Koipatek Forest in January. Uh, the pick I took on the top right um, is now an official um, piece of Kenyan Forest Service history. Um, it shows the CFA workers decked out in the quality gear that they needed. And I've never seen a more proud group of workers once they were all kitted out in this gear and with the right equipment to go out and, and do the job. And then it was out um, to the forest and to do the um, on-the-spot training with the CFA workers. Earlier in the contract, John had run a five-day workshop for the uh, Kenyan Forest Service foresters. It was structured around uh, continuous improvement and looking at the ISO 9000 quality management system there. The workshop also enabled the foresters to achieve a reasonable level of competency in work measurement and to do dime studies and to capture data so they could make better decisions based on the facts and the measurements and to set up the quality systems. In the top right picture, uh, there should not be four straggly trees being pruned. Um, that's just a complete waste of time. While the new equipment will help prune the tree right, it is the quality systems being put in place for the future that will ensure the right tree is pruned, uh, like the one in the foreground here. So, um, this, this is the team of foresters that I mentioned um, John Train, so that's the team. And here they are out in the uh, forest um, doing time studies and then back into the office to um, put all that captured data and, and analyse all the data. So this shows some of the tasks carried out by the um, Community Forest Association workers. Um, all ages and genders carry out the work. And here you can see nursery work being carried out um, and planting amongst the potatoes uh, and transferring the seeds out to the planting areas. Uh, young mothers bring their babies to work. Uh, so all, all ages are involved. Although I did notice a lot of older men sit around it quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I know, I, I, I was going to say something else, but I thought, oh no. <laughs> so, um, this, these images show elephant damage, um, where elephants strip the bark, um, they lean on the trees as well. Um, yes, and uh, so little shelters are built all throughout the potato plantations. And basically, it's the young men's role to, uh, at night to patrol the potato plantations. And should the elephants come by, um, they'll light fires to deter them. Uh, and this photo down here, um, John with one of the foresters, they were waiting for some workers. And it just shows electric fences going for miles all around the potato plantations. So they have, have that as well. Elephants love potatoes and are great at remembering where they're grown. <laughs> mm. So um, I mentioned earlier that the um, CFA workers and the farmers use pungas um, like machetes um, to prune the trees. Well, well, farmers and the workers, they, they use these pungas for just about every job you can imagine. And here they're used to digging holes for seedlings. They'll use it to dig a hole to plant the potato in. Um, you've got a young boy making a pithy stick to use for herding his goats. He's probably only about 10, so I don't think we would 
send any of our 10 year olds out to play with one of these machete like things. Um, now these girls here, they were gathering firewood in one of the forests and they'd just received a huge telling off from the uh, forester that we were with. Um, they were gathering firewood way too close to a logging area and it was only the day before that um, a lady had been killed because she was gathering wood too close to the felling area. So these girls were not looking very happy at all. <laughs> So that's really just the, the short snapshot I wanted to give you of the forestry work John was doing there. And I thought I'd just like to mention one or two other really positive things that, that we saw happening in Kenya. Because looking after the, the environment is part of the Miti Mingi Mai Shibora program and its objective, there is um, a government run uh, environmental program also involving primary schools. And every child is given two trees to plant, one at school and one at home. And Kenya seems to have schools, even in the remotest parts um, we saw them. And it was one of these schools that we saw the education ministry arrive one morning with a huge big box of trees to, to give out to the children to plant. So I feel we witnessed a, a really good example of teaching young children about their environment and planting trees to conserve for the future generations. Uh, primary school is compulsory in Kenya and it is free. It's not till the children get to secondary school that the parents have to start paying fees. Kenya was also celebrating 50 years of independence when we were there. And there were many signs all around the country like this that um, just showed a sense of patriotism, a sense of hope and complete optimism for their future. Um, there are great people, the Kenyans. So that's kind of it about the forestry side of things. I don't know if there's any little questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, is, is, does corruption pose a big challenge for the program around the trees? Uh, well, corruption is everywhere and at all levels, um, is what our understanding came to be. Um, perhaps not just in particular on that program, but through different levels. <laughs> Um, of, of the Forest Service and possibly and, and other government. Yeah, so I can't say that specifically in, in that program, but it's definitely there. Yeah. Any other quick questions about that? <laughs> Maybe at the end, yes. So when Mogra, so when John was out working, or when he was working in the uh, Forest Service office in Nairobi, um, this is where I went sometimes, um, to the Mogra Children's Rescue Centre and Home. Children often arrive here via the police or via other government departments. Um, they've been abandoned or they're sick uh, or their parents have died because they've been so ill or their, their health is not good enough for them to be able to work. Before I left New Zealand, I acquired two small cameras from my friends at Canon. Um, I was hoping to have the opportunity to be able to work with some children at an orphanage um, using the cameras and helping them just to use their imagination. So to cut a long story short, um, I met Mogra one afternoon. Um, I divided the kids into two groups and started sort of introducing them to the um, building blocks of design, shape, colour, form and texture and that sort of thing. And um, I gave them two words to think about, uh, love and strength, and I just got them to think um, how they might frame those words and what they wanted to see through the frame that would represent those words to them. So, oops, go on. Okay. So, this lady, Hannah, uh, she was the founder of the Rescue Centre in uh, 1996, I think it was. And these other photos were taken um, at a Christmas party that I went to, or the Christmas party at the orphanage. Uh, Mogra also has a, a little farm project which is in the grounds of the orphanage. Uh, this machine here was very proudly shown to me. Uh, it 
thrashes the um, maize that's grown for the, for the cows to eat, um, whereas they used to have to do that by hand and someone had recently donated this machine. Uh, so they were very proud of that. Um, they grow plenty of vegetables, so the children are eating good, nutritious meals every night. Uh, and they've got a little car wash, which I don't think brings in a lot of money, but it helps with a few basic bits and pieces. So, as I said, I gave the, the kids two words to think about, um, and while they were carrying out this project, I was busy photographing them doing it, and it was just amazing to see their imaginations take over. I didn't try to get into any technical side of uh, photography, I just wanted them to use this, because you can use your imagination in anything. So, um, here they are, and just the joy they got from using the cameras and uh, the way they used, I think the girls over the side there, they were kind of making a heart shape, so to them that was love. Um, and these are the pictures that the kids took, aren't they amazing? Just the wee boys up in the corner being strong, so that was how they determined strength could be shown. Um, love, yeah. I was really impressed with them. So uh, at the Christmas party, I organised for their images to be printed up and got there early and we hung the exhibition in the same hall that the party was going to be in. Uh, and I got them, I sort of showed them how to start going about doing artist statements and writing their thoughts down about why they enjoyed the work they did in the project. And also on the day that I arrived for the Christmas party, um, Hannah, who you saw in the picture earlier, she said to me, Jenny, your present to the children today will be to take all of their portraits. And I thought, my gosh, there's 150 children, how on earth am I going to do that in a day? But anyway, I did, and I started in the nursery. Uh, there's a full-time nurse employed in the nursery, and she helped me. She obviously, someone had to hold the babies. Um, some we just couldn't wake up. <laughs> uh, but what um, I really feel good about is these children now have an image of themselves for later in life, so I just felt, felt that really special. Some of the older children. And the Mograstar Academy is the school that Hannah set up shortly after she set up the rescue centre. So there is a, a, a huge um, slum area, the children from the slum as well as the children from the orphanage go to this school. Uh, as you can see, it's certainly um, not what we would expect to see here at all. Um, this is the library. Uh, some of the younger kids having a little snooze after their lunch. And this is the existing computer room. And none of those computers work. I think they've been fixed so many times that they just don't have the money to, to try and get them going again. So I'd just like to again thank you for inviting me here um, to speak today. Um, we had an amazing time over there, uh, it was fantastic. The end, and that picture's for William because I know he likes elephants. <laughs> <laughs>